Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. Today's presentation is for you, the members of the Anderson Ranch National Council. In my three years as executive director, I've gotten to know so many of you, and I really rely on you for your advice and for your support. So thank you so much for that. And I'd like to thank all of you who helped make Anderson Ranch what it is today. So here's a round of applause for you. <laughs> I'd also like to thank all of our sponsors with a very special thank you to Sue Hostetler and Donald Drapkin and Toby Devin Lewis who have sponsored today's program and the following events at Casa Tua. So thank you so much. <laughs> Toby Lewis, who will introduce Lisa Phillips, is an art collector, an author, and a curator. She was a trustee for Anderson Ranch from 2002 through 2005, and she remains as a member of our National Council. We're so pleased about that. And Toby was a curator at Progressive for 25 years, and she has helped the careers of countless emerging artists and continues to do so through her Toby Fund. So please join me in welcoming Toby Lewis. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Lisa Phillips. I'm on the board of the New Museum in New York, so I work with Lisa often and a lot. And she's more than my director. She's become a really good friend. We travel together in groups. We travel together individually. And um, it's been wonderful, wonderful getting to know you. So we're all very fortunate to have her here at the Anderson Ranch today to moderate the conversation with two leading millennial artists, Trevor Paglin and Ryan Tricartin. Lisa has been the director of the New Museum since 1999. During her tenure, she has tripled the size of the museum, its board, its staff, its budget, and its attendance. She also conceived and realized a major expansion of the museum's first dedicated building. Prior to arriving at the new museum, Lisa was a curator at the Whitney Museum for two decades, where she organized six biennial exhibitions, <laughs> several landmark thematic exhibitions, including Image World, Art and Media Culture, Beat Culture and the New America, and the American Century as well as the first museum exhibitions of Richard Prince, Terry Winters, and Cindy Sherman. At the new museum, Lisa has co-curated exhibitions by Carol Dunham, Paul McCarthy, and John Waters, and most recently organized a major survey of the work of Chris Burden. Lisa has authored over 20 publications has lectured extensively throughout the world, held several teaching po positions, one as visiting critic at Yale University, and was named one of the top 40 New Yorkers by Time Out magazine, and top 100 business women of the year by Cranes. It is with great admiration and respect that I now turn the program over to Lisa. So today we're going to talk about um, art in the digital age. And, um, and I want to thank the Anderson Ranch for having me here. The iPhone only made its appearance seven years ago, but most of us no longer remember what the world was like before it. Driverless cars were considered to be a crazy fantasy not long ago. But today we hear about prototypes that are going to be released next year. 
Algorithms in the U.S. control some 70% of all trading on the stock market. That sounds crazy, but it's now normal. Dozens of companies are trying to figure out how to use drones for commercial use, be it for deliveries, data collection, or other purposes. And huge armies of engineers are chasing after the holy grail of artificial intelligence. The advances just keep coming fast and furiously. Machines that can learn, intelligent robots are close at hand. And we've really begun overtaking science fiction at this point. So we're, we're really witnessing nothing less than a huge societal transformation that ultimately no one will be able to avoid. It's the kind of sea change that we can really only compare with 19th century industrialization, but it's happening so much faster this time. Uh, just as the change from handwork to mass production dramatically altered society 100 years ago, the digital revolution isn't just altering specific sectors of the economy, it's changing the way we think and live. It's also changing how culture is produced and received. Many artists are creating new forms of art that reflect these changes and reveal the complexities of the digital age. Today, I'm so pleased to welcome Ryan Tricartan and Trevor Paglin, two leading artists of the new millennium who are deeply in tune with these massive changes. And they've seen the future. They see the future. Their approaches are so different, uh, but they're both changing the conversation about culture and uh, they're highlighting the urgencies and possibilities of this new age. So we're gonna hear from each of them today, individually, and then we're gonna have a conversation together. But before we do that, I wanna say just a few words about the museum's role in this changing landscape, which has uh, caused, in our, in our case, at the New Museum, has brought us into frequent dialogue with these two artists. And I really admire their work tremendously. Um, the new museum has been at the forefront of the intersection of art and technology since the turn of this new century, and maybe I can have the first slide. <laughs> uh, our mission is to embrace innovation and cross-disciplinary creation and support new forms of art making. And our core audience is millennials, so we have to be there. We have to be at the forefront. We were the first museum to devote a space to digital works. Um, the next photo, please. That's uh, our media lounge, which now seems like a really archaic idea. That was 12 years ago. <laughs> uh, next slide. And the next. Uh, then we, 10 years ago, we brought on the leading digital arts organization, Rhizome, as an affiliate in residence at the new museum as our new media arm. And they really revolutionized our thinking at the museum. We began to integrate them into our curatorial program. Uh, one of our signature projects with uh, Rhizome is Seven on Seven. Next slide. Um, and that is a program where we pair top artists with top technologists to produce something new and share it with the public. Next slide, please. Uh, both Ryan and Trevor have been part of this program recently. And here you're seeing one of the projects that we produced. Um, this is <laughs> Friend Fracker. <coughs> it's a collaboration between Harper Reed, who was a, a hacker and the chief technology officer for the 2012 Obama campaign, uh, together with Rafael Lozano Hemmer, the art, who's an artist. Um, and they created this platform that randomly de deletes friends when you click onto it. So <laughs> instead of uh, defriending, which has a very negative connotation, this was just random friend fracking. So <laughs> um, at the same time, we transformed our website into its own experiential space, a parallel destination to the museum itself, to the museum building. So museums are no longer just buildings. We're software platforms, too. And, um, and websites are their own destination. So we began to actively commission work for our website. Next slide, please. Uh, this is one by Brenna Murphy called 
Cavern Code. And next slide, um, another by Taryn Simon in collaboration with Aaron Schwartz called Image Atlas. Both of these are highly interactive works that you can only experience online. <laughs> okay. Um, we've also grown our web traffic to over 2 million unique views annually, and our social media platforms have exploded. We have over a million followers on social media in less than five years. Um, a year ago, we launched New Inc. Um, next slide. And that is um, the first museum-led incubator for creatives working at the intersection of art, technology, and design. Next slide. <laughs> we have over 100 people working in this space um, next door to the museum in a building that we own next door. Last week, we showcased their projects developed over the past year. And interestingly, many of them are breaking down boundaries of what it means thanks, to be a creative practitioner. They're much more fluid in their self-definition of, of what it means to be a, a creative, creative person today or an artist today. And here they are um, experimenting with Oculus Rift. Okay, finally, this fall we're going to release a book with MIT Press called Mass Effect which is the first anthology to look at the impact of the internet on art and the history and debate around that. What is the status of the studio artist in an era of total interconnectivity and online production? How should we think about authorship and identity in the context of crowdsourcing and online communities? And furthermore, where should we draw the lines of the art world when artists are increasingly apt with each new generation to circulate their work on platforms far removed from traditional institutional frameworks. So these are some of the questions that we're going to consider today with these two great artists. And we're going to start with Ryan. I'm going to introduce him now. Uh, born in 1981, uh, Ryan is an American artist and filmmaker uh, based in LA. He studied at the Rhode Island School of Design graduating with a BFA in 2004. Uh, he, um, his creative partner and long-term collaborator is Lizzie Fitch, who's here somewhere. There she is, <laughs> uh, who will be speaking later this week with Ryan. And he's been working with Lizzie since 2000. Uh, Ryan's feature-length video works update moving image practice for the internet age. His fast-growing body of work explores the impulses and attitudes of a generation whose Self-perceptions and relationships are deeply tied to media. His first major solo exhibition entitled Any Ever started at the power plant in Toronto and traveled to the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA. His work has been included in the Generational Younger Than Jesus at the New Museum, the Whitney Biennial in 2006, and uh, most recently he was the co-curator of the 2015 New Museum Triennial Surround Audience. He's represented by Regan Projects and Andrea Rosen Gallery, and I invite him to join me on the stage. Thanks, everybody, Thanks. for being here and for having me out. Um, okay. I, should we show that clip of Florida? Yeah. I was thinking before we have any questions the questions. I just showed this one clip. Lizzie and I are going to show a bunch of clips when we do a talk, so I'm only showing one right now, and it's two minutes long, and it's a trailer we, we made for the Any Ever Show at PS1, but the, the first two movies from this actually showed in Younger Than Jesus, and, and that show gave us an opportunity to, to work on a much larger body of work that we evolved then over the next two years, and then they showed at PS1. So this is a trailer. For that. Being post family and pre hotel ends today for me. Do you not identify with the girl? There's nothing wrong with stopping things early. Adobe, do you think Brett would be mad if we stopped the premise early? Yeah, yeah, but. JD, I just found out I'm driving! I am not the only star to do that stuff. I've been a CEO since birth. I want that. Finally, I'm finally just an as if. Sense me now. Cedar, 
My advice to you... I can't wait until they invent concept camo. I'm gonna go wash off this picket fence and fuck up a tanning bed. People! <laughs> Look at what I use, people! Merch! 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 Oh, I love acid! Cute. Hey, bitch. All I'm saying is... Capitulation is sexy when you land on the right vibration. And together, we're told. All I try very hard to be transparent. There are no people. We create energy. I love redistributing myself to people who haven't learned about me yet. Where's Globally? Your friends have no doubt. I mean, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I also made this. I'm describing a personality trait. I owned a pretty really rad exchangeable racially aggressive body parts. Am I over existing or am I over existing? That's my inside joke. What? I'm really into the third world right now. I collect things. I just designed an airplane that has ashtrays in the air. Can you believe that ashtray? Sure. Are we still in prison? I love being in places that mean nothing to me. Now let me take this memory without fear of further utilizing it. Possibilities pretend to be endless, but they're actually. I'm gonna bounce, burn down the house, mail me a hotel. Great. Great. So, um, I wanted to start by just asking you a little bit about um, your background and your education. I was really struck by how a film that you you shot in high school, Junior War, predicted so much of your later work. So, um, did you always know what you wanted to do? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> I I always knew that I wanted to make stuff, and back then that just meant I don't totally know what that meant at the time. I I grew up in Ohio. And I didn't really learn about contemporary art until I moved to like a farm town outside of Toledo. Um, and I had a really awesome art teacher there. Uh, growing up, I did dance and music and, and drama or acting and stuff. And just me and my brother would just make con contractions and games. And, you know, I never really thought of like what would happen with it. It was just ex experimenting. And, when I got to this high school, they didn't have a dance department and these things that I was doing at the time. And so I took art classes and I had this amazing art teacher that was just like, well, you know, all that is art, so just do it here and it'll be art. And it made sense to me at the time and still does. <laughs> but I, when I went to RISD, that's how I found out about RISD. I also took like a college class then but when I was still in high school, photography class, and that's when I learned about, you know, like Cindy Sherman, and I started knowing there was an, an art world. So I went to Rizzi. This is our house that me and Lizzie and a bunch of people lived in. I just decided to have this image because you had a question about background. That's not everybody who lived in the house. A lot of people there didn't, but, and a lot of people who did aren't <laughs> in it. But... Um, we had a band called Experimental People, which we eventually thought was an embarrassing name and changed it to XPPL. But um, I just thought it'd be funny to show that. And this is the, the first video I ever made where I, when, right when I got to college was when the first hard drives were coming out um, that made it a lot easier to be, well, the cheap ones where like I could buy one and you could, and iMovie. And so, I edited this on iMovie, that's Lizzie, and it was the first time we like collaborated together. Um, we weren't thinking of it in that way at the time. We were just doing things near each other and slowly letting them like merge into each other's work. She made all of these uh, soft sculptures, and, and then I filmed a scene where we didn't have any dialogue, it was more like physical actions. Um, and then that's a Family Finds Entertainment, which is like the movie I made senior year of college that we passed around on the internet. Well, not on the internet. We got people's, because you couldn't stream video yet. It was like 2004. So we were meeting people on Friendster and just hmm. mailing it out. And that's 
it was like our first show where we made all these sculptures, and it was like, I just thought it'd be funny to show it. Um, okay. <laughs> so your work has been described as breaking news from the future. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what you feel the urgencies or new freedoms are in this, in this changed world, or the technology provides. Well, um, I mean, I don't think that I am breaking news, <laughs> but I, and I think this is probably always true that um, people feel like what, at the time that they're living, it's like an exciting time. I would think that people always feel that way and that things are ch always changing. And I, uh, the urgency, I'm, I'm really interested in the way people communicate and the way like humanity is expressed and the different types of nuances people have inside of these sort of basic arrangements we make up, like, you know, things like mom, dad, siblings, or like different types of relationships and communities. And, and I think that like with t different technologies, uh, there's, and the way like sort of capitalism like affects the English language I'm very interested in how all the the modularness of, of language and and the free and the freedom that can exist in in hijacking and altering and co-opting and changing and growing language. So I think that I'm like just alive at a time where that's like really present in everyone's mind and um, particularly interested in the way. Uh, life is captured and how that develops vocabularies around like body language and how people have to use a lot of different schools of thought to express an idea in the, the landscape that we're in right now, if that makes yeah. well, um, sense. Wasn't your first platform really the internet though? I mean, you spoke about how you sent things out over the internet yeah. to people originally to um, introduce what you were doing to them. Yeah, it developed was developed a community. It was definitely my first tool for sharing mm -hmm. and and I and I continue to share everything there because I think it's it's very native to the way we work and the form that we the forms that we work in. But um, yeah, we we were just meeting people on Friendster that we thought seemed interesting. We would just ask for their address and mail them packages of stuff we were making and then different people started showing it. And that's kind of like how we actually got into showing in an art context. Somehow the work just so perfectly describes the condition that we find ourselves in today, though. I mean, it, it, it really is an emblem for, uh, for this age. And I think a lot of that has to do with the blurred boundary between the artificial and the real. I wonder if you sense that that's shifted in your lifetime. Yeah, um, well, I remember being and well, so when I revisited that, I shot a bunch of footage in high school in 1999. And at the time, I thought I was making a documentary, and then I didn't revisit it until uh, 2013, and that's when I edited it. And we'll show some clips when Lizzie and I do a talk two days from now, if any of y'all come to that. But um, I was really struck by the relationship people had to the camera, because like you said, and when you were giving the introduction, you forget how much has changed just in the past five years. It's, it's pretty uh, outrageous when you actually look back. And at the time, because you couldn't broadcast video online yet, um, and you couldn't stream it, there was, when I would bring out the camera, everyone was like, why do you have this? Are you gonna narc on us? Like everyone thought it was, the only thing that could come out of it is something negative, or they just didn't notice I had it. And then once people embraced the idea because the Blair Witch, project happened at the same time and like people were really into this idea of making something that to pretend like it's real but it was actually scripted and we were kind of doing the opposite we were doing things and then pretending that they were scripted <laughs> <laughs> and um and then calling it a documentary but that sort of movie helped me explain what I was trying to do even though I wasn't necessarily I, I at the time I wasn't even sure what I was trying to do and um, but the, I was really struck by people's relationship to the camera because it's pre-people developing a language for being captured 
and communicating in that landscape. Mm -hmm. So when, um, when that came back up, I, I started just reflecting on where like capturing technology is going. And I forgot what your question was. So I was going somewhere with it. Um, well, it's about oh, the, the real and the artificial. Yeah, I don't think there's a difference for... That's not a difference. I never have ever seen it as a difference because I think that everything is real and everything has value. And so just because one reality might have less participation in it, it doesn't mean it's not real. And, and I think authenticity is a, is a moment mm. in time. It's not like inherent to anything. So an authentic moment is like almost like an agreement. Um, but something made with very sincere intentions or with a sense of authenticity can be later used in ways that have, are very divorced from that. So I, I just, and can become real to another group of people in a, in a new form. And, and I think that there's a lot of, you know, the way like sort of like queer theory and um, gender sort of politics have really sort of come a long way. I think you're, we're starting to see really unusual forms of that seep into culture mm -hmm. that and, and outside of uh, gender and sexuality and people are sort of derooting things um, and accessing them as vocabulary sets and using them to build ideas. And in some senses, it's really frightening to some people because it's, it can, you know, every, every community, every, every network has its own set of parameters and realities. And there's people are learning how to let things co coexist. You can have both. You don't have to have one or, but the binaries yeah. don't have to be there for progress to happen, I guess. So in your film, there's films, there's a lot of fluidity and transmutation and along the lines of what you're talking about, of sort of unmooring stereotypes and, and opening up possibilities for shape-shifting and, and transforming identities. Um, and we were talking before about how there are over 100 ways to sexually identify right now. <laughs> that's, that's changing as fast as technology and probably because of it, I think. Yeah, I mean, people are, it. I mean, when you, when you have an opportunity to, to to experience other peoples who, who are f far away, you just, there's more out there. I mean, <laughs> a, but. So talk a little bit about uh, language and translation because I know that's a topic that um, is important to you. Well, I'm really interested in, in the translation of, of ideas and sensations and, and mediums um, I like really interested in the way uh, language is translated, but I only know one language. So, the way that I've translated stuff has been very much uh, a mess. But I'm interested in what that creates. So, um, we uh, the process, the sort of production process we have is like a, a series of, of scripting processes, and every script is its own is its own um, language that then gets translated. Because when, when we, um, like all the different performers we work with, they're all artists, and we cast different sort of platforms where they can sort of create inside of the script. And so some people, you know, will be like translating an idea, some people will be channeling it, and some people will be acting it or performing it. And then every sort of single component that interacting, interaction is a form of translation and script writing in itself. And like the end part of, of editing mm -hmm. is a translation and a scripting at the same time. But in like, I mean, those like those general terms of translation, I feel like inside of that, there's more details. I just don't really well, we know. We were talking about how you look at words and how you look at, at written yeah. language as a visual form, which I think is oh, yeah. I mean, really interesting. I'm not the best you know, reader and stuff. And so I feel like when I was growing up, I would always look at words for their form and the way that they sound and think about how that translates to ideas outside of the definition that that particular word might have. 
And I feel like the, when, I, when I'm translating a, a spoken sentence, I'm also thinking about the formal qualities um, in, in, the, in, the, in the written form and also in how the sound relates to the space and to color. And, mm -hmm. and I, th I see sort of all body language and visuals as being an extension of the verbal vocabulary. So in the movies, I think a lot of times everything that's happening on a screen is like a, an extension of, of the language being expressed and a translation of it. Well, the titles are always amazing. Do you title everything or? Well, not everything. I mean, Lizzie uh, works on the titles and sometimes someone else will have an idea and it'll like, we'll use it. IB so. area. I mean, any ever. I came up with those. But Sur <laughs> I like, the, the, but yeah, the titles are really important to us as like poetic jumping off points. They're like frames or like rafts or vehicles to begin the digestion process, but they are not like, you know, we, we, we tend to not want to explain what a piece is doing because we really like people to have multiple reads mm -hmm. because we're, even when we're making work, we want to create opportunities for ideas rather than reducing what something could be. So I feel like we use titles as an opportunity to do that. Like give someone a jumping off point, but it doesn't like close it down. So um, I know you're also interested in marketing and mass retail, and you have a personal interest in that, and um, as well as the idea of self-branding, which has just become you know, kind of more and more important, I think, for, for millennials, it's, it's huge. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you were going to show something oh, well, I, uh, um, related to that. These are, this is, both of these are from the Younger Than Jesus show. And it's the beginning of the Any Ever body of work. And I'm, just, I'm showing these right now because I think Lizzie and I, starting with the Younger Than Jesus show, developed... Um, uh, and our, started to develop our ideas more clearly around how we're presenting the, the movies in a, in, a, in a gallery or a museum context and how, what, you know, what opportunities are there. And we started to use, you know, the basic like theater setup as, as a landscape for, for language. So we were started compositing furniture and using furniture elements in a, in a similar way to the way language is used in, in the movies. Um, and so, you know, like there's like these composites where like there's the couch on, on top of this bed that has these rugs on it and the pillows are on top of the posts. And it's kind of like a, like a poetic reconfiguring of like the, the theater space and some other form of space that involves some form of human communication. So this is like a bedroom and a living room merged with the theater, um, which, you know, changes the, and it's called living comp. And it sort of changes the way the movie Ready that shows in it is read. And one of the things about Lizzie and I had spent a lot of time thinking about context because a lot the, with, with the movies in particular, they're native to different formats. And if you watch it online or if you watch it in the movie theater versus this, each one of those forms pulls out different aspects of the content and the way you would read a narrative. Um, so, you know, if you were to watch this movie in a movie theater, you would you would start you you're trained to see things as scenes and to see a movie from beginning to end, and you would read it very differently than you do in an environment that sort of reflects conceptually the ideas that are in the verbal language of, of the movie. And then you know on the internet you start reading more the technological aspects into it and just the ability you have to like start and stop and pause and, and read it in different directions. But, um, and here's a good example of like a composite furniture. Uh, you can kind of see it, but, um, and, mm. yeah. yeah. Oh, the capitalism so question. <laughs> uh, I thought these would be good images to show for that. Um, with this. What are they? These are uh, four photos I did for W Magazine, mm -hmm. and I took the opportunity to take that editorial format as, as a platform for a script. And so the portrait is a script itself, 
And I, when, I, when, I, when I write scripts for the movies, they often just look like a long poem. But I took that and translated it into like visual cues. And so one of the, your question about like branding, I feel like I, I think about that very like naturally. It's not necessarily at the forefront, but I don't think anyone's capable of, of avoiding branding at this point. Even when you try to evade it, you're, you're creating a brand. Um, and if you're interacting with people in any way, there's some sense of, of a personal brand that is grown because you don't totally have control over your brand. It's something that's shared and maintained through your interactions with other people. And that's part of what IB area is a little bit about because you are your, your area, your, your landscape. You are not like your body. Um, I think one of the most incredible things about the work are the, char the characters. And I wonder if you could just um, share for a moment about how you develop them and what, how you think about them. Well, I mean, every character and is developed differently because there's always there's a it's developed with the the person who acts it, and every movie has like a different premise, so the characters are developed differently for different movies. But in general, like for for any ever. Um, I, I was thinking of character, characters as vehicles. Um, I saw that as like a constellation of movies that have like a mesh of linearities, and a character is like a, a thread or a, a linearity within inside of it, and they aren't all moving in the same direction, and they are the, their ideas don't necessarily like add up to something that's possible, and that contrast and that conflict is, I think, where the interesting content in the movies actually happens. So the, I was, I was, a lot of the characters have names like Mass Major or like Cedar or Britta, and they have, just like the titles in the movies are supposed to like give a sense of somebody's like didactic role in the movie, like what they are as a sentence or like as a definition and what they are as like an ism within the movie. Um, and then them as a vehicle for transformation and, and threading ideas through the movie. But then with the newer work, Priority Infield movies, I was seeing characters as game pieces and they were like proxies and they were fixed and they're not transformative and they don't have freedom. And there's this idea that they're inside of a system where the true freedom is the people outside of the system playing the proxies. And so it's a cropped view and the ability to navigate between different, different like character sets and character vocabularies and proxies is, is where the freedom is. But what you're actually seeing is kind of a, an upsetting, potentially upsetting, less celebratory mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, right. state of these ideas. Whereas in any effort, it was much more sort of about the individual and, and it was celebratory and a lot of malleability and like freedom of thought and, hmm. and you know, it didn't show the body much. It was much more about like somebody is their ideas. Whereas in Center of Jenny, you see like the bodies and they are like a game piece. So I don't know if that makes sense. Great. Just to explain how there's a difference. So we're going, <laughs> to, we're going to come back to some of your other projects when we all speak together. Um, and I think we're going to hear now from Trevor for a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if we're synced up properly, but yeah. thank you so much. That's... And you'll be back up in yeah. a moment. Come on up. <laughs> so well, welcome Trevor Paglin, who is an American artist, geographer, and author. He has a really unusual background. Um, he got his MFA from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago and then followed that with a PhD from Berkeley on the history and geography of American secrecy. Yeah, Is that right? That's correct. <laughs> um, he's shown his photographs at Mass MoCA, the Andy Warhol Museum, the SF MoMA, and the New Museum, among uh, many others. And uh, this year, he was a participant in Seven on Seven at the New Museum, working with Mike Krieger, the co-founder of Instagram. Mm -hmm. It was an yeah. interesting collaboration. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Paglin worked, also worked on the film Citizen Four, and he launched a satellite with Creative Time. How many artists can say that? He is the author of several books, including Blank Spots on the Map, Dark, The Dark Geography of the Pentagon's Secret World. 
Um, and uh, yeah, okay, he's represented by Metro Pictures <laughs> where he's gonna have an exhibition this fall. So doing a whole range of activities. Um, Trevor, I wanted to ask you as an artist, what, in what way are you interested in images and image making? I know you've thought a lot about that. Yeah, um, well, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll just throw up one of my images here real quickly. Um, I guess I'm interested in images as a way to see the historical moment that we live in. And I mean that very, very literally. I mean, like, what does the world look like here in, you know, July 2015 or whatever it is? And I think that images are a part of, they're kind of like a vocabulary that we use to understand just what the world is and what the world looks like at any particular moment in time. And so I'm interested in images in that sense, but I'm also interested in the fact that images are extremely slippery and bizarre things in the sense that I actually don't think images mean anything at all. I think that the, the instant you try to force an image to mean something, it will run away from you. And so I'm, I'm really interested in, in images as inherently self-contradictory things, like things that on one hand are a part of the vocabulary that we use to understand the world and understand our place within it, but at the same time, things that, that whose meaning you can't really pin down and whose meaning will always run away from you the second that you try to pin it down too much. And so, I mean, I think this is like, these, these slides here is pretty typical of my process and kind of, um, exemplify that, that, that wanting to see something and that, that image running away from you at the same time. These are documents right here that I use as part of a project that I've been doing for many, many years at this point, where it's tracking all of the secret satellites in orbit around the Earth. So I have a project where all I do is like try to find satellites around the Earth that don't exist, right? And a, and a part of that is using star charts, understanding the night sky, and a part of that is collaborating and corresponding a lot with um, astronomers around the world, astronomers who go out and are looking at the sky on any given night, and they might see something moving and say, well, what's this, and try to look it up somewhere and not find it. Um, and, the, and the reason for that is that because they've seen something secret. So I do a lot of work to collect this information, process it, build you know, models, in the, you know, software models describing satellite orbits and systems like this that are designed to track stars and satellites um, and to make images that basically look like this. And this is basically a bunch of dots in a line, right? And so if you were to encounter a photograph like this in a gallery, it might say like, oh, well, this is this particular satellite and this is the constellation that it's in and so on and so forth. But at the same time, you know, as one of the early reviews of this body of work was someone said, or, but it also just looks like he scratched the film, you know, with, and, and that's, also, um, that's also true. And so like that, that inherent kind of contradiction in images is, is something that I think can be really productive, actually. So um, I think one of the most important things that um, you've done is unsettling our conceptions about digital technology as being, and the internet as being so immaterial. You know, we think about the cloud and the internet as just being in the ether and, and um, you're really interested in revealing the material and the structure of, of digital communications. Mm -hmm. So how do you learn to do that and what do you want to share with yeah, your so audience? This, this, is the, this is something that, I've, that I have been looking at for a, a long time, just trying to understand telecommunication systems and and there has been a focus on power and the ways in which power throws through uh, technology and communications technology in particular. Um, but, so that is, for example, satellites and that sort of thing. But I've been friends with a woman named Laura Poitras for a long time, who's the director of Citizen Four. And when Edward Snowden kind of came to her, she came to me basically and said, well, you know, this crazy thing's about to happen where we're, we're about to really learn a whole lot about how the NSA works and how the National Security Agency works. And she said, you know, I'm working on this film. Why don't you help? And why don't, and um, why, we'll do a project where we, first of all, are gonna look at this archive of documents that Snowden has provided and try to learn how to see 
by using this archive, how to learn how to see what mass surveillance looks like, what global telecommunication structures look like, and then go out and try to make images that, um, that can, can aid us in that act of seeing. So this is an example of a Snowden slide. This is one I think is one of the most remarkable Snowden slides that, has, that very few people have commented on that basically shows the, um, the, the kinds of networks that the NSA uses to spy on people or to spy on entire countries or the entire world for that matter. Um, the orange dots here are, are what are, are places where they spy on satellites. Um, regional, these, these um, red dots are places where they um, are using embassies to spy on people. So they use, on most embassies and um, consulates, they'll have spy stations on top of them. Um, the green dots are third-party liaison. That will be um, foreign intelligence company services that they collaborate with. The yellow dots here, where it says CNE, that stands for Computer Network Exploitation. So those are places where they've actually hacked other government or other um, or foreign companies' telecommunications hardware or software and either implanted viruses or bugging equipment to kind of collect things from all over the world clandestinely. And then these blue sites are here are red, represented as large cable. And what those are are fi fiber optic cable choke points. And so the vast majority of global telecommunications doesn't go over satellites. It goes through undersea cables, so fiber optic cables that are at the bottom of the ocean. And those cables come on shore at very specific places. There's basically four places on the west coast and two on the east coast. So the one on, you have a picture of one on the east yeah, coast. Yeah, so, um, so one of the things that I've been doing, one of the projects has been going to these choke points and photographing them. And the rules of the image is that inside the frame there has to be this collection of tapped fiber optic cables, but at the same time there's no evidence of it in the image itself. So again, kind of coming back to that, Im that idea of Here's an image that's helping us try to understand the historical moment that we live in, but also the image runs away from any evidentiary or kind of realistic thing that you want it to be. So this is the beach at um, near the Hamptons. Yeah, this is in Center Long Island. Yeah. Uh, it is Mastic, Mastic Beach. In, Mastic Mastic Beach, Hampton. which is right where TWA Flight 800 went down. Right, absolutely. You I find that an unbelievable that. coincidence, yeah. but maybe <laughs> um, not a coincidence. So I've been looking at these like nautical charts a lot that are, um, these are really the, some of the few documents that, that show more or less precisely where these cables are. And these are docu the maps that are designed for ship captains so they don't put anchors on top of these lines and pull them up. They are, but they are considered critical infrastructure, so they don't really like talking about where they are. Um, so more recently, what I, I learned how to scuba dive so I thought, well, what would happen if you actually dived into the ocean in these photographs? And so this is a preview of, 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 of some of that that'll, that'll be at this exhibition. Is that, that off the Mauritius? What's that? Uh, where are you diving here? This is off the um, coast of Miami, actually, and this is one of the guys I was working with, and this down here. This is a and production a, shot. Is that a cable? Yeah, this is a fiber optic cable on the ocean floor. Wow. Um, these, are, you know, these are just from my own archives. These are, I wasn't making these, you have to make these grids to try to find these things on the bottom of the ocean. It's, it's kind of a pain in the butt. Um, here's another image of, uh, this is one of these fiber optic cables on the bottom of the ocean. Um, yeah. So your images are often really abstract, yeah. and I know you're very interested in that and conscious of your relationship to history of abstraction, both yeah. in painting and photography. Yeah. Um, and, and the idea of the sublime, but I wonder yeah. how you, how, how you think about the relationship of the abstraction um, and the sublime to this revelation of, of data and materials. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I guess what, on, on one hand, I'm very conscious of art history, and I, and I feel like as someone who is an artist or, is, or people who are, whether you're a curator or a collector, I feel like those of us who are involved in, in art and art history are speaking to the present moment, but are also in a dialogue where we're speaking to our ancestors, we're learning from our ancestors, we're speaking to our descendants. And so we're, we're part of this historical um, narrative that's been, or this historical tradition, or this historical conversation that's been happening for thousands of years. And so when I'm, when I'm looking at, there's nothing that I look at that some other artist hasn't looked at before me in the past. And I feel like my, my job is to look at it 
and try to see what is specific to this moment versus what some an, another artist from a different generation saw looking at the same thing at their historical moment. So this is, for example, a Stiglitz, and this is one of his equivalents, and this is considered an early example of abstraction in photography. And what Stiglitz did simply was point cameras and photograph the sky. Um, and I, I look at these traditions of abstraction a lot, and one of the series that I have is going out in the middle of the desert in Nevada and photographing the sky with large format cameras. But it's a particular place in the desert where I know that they fly military you know, robot assassination drones in the sky there. And so I would go and I would go before dawn and shoot images where is like it? this. It's um <laughs> there it it's is. actually right next to the Nevada test site where they blew up all the nuclear weapons like in the nineteen oh. fifties and sixties. And if you go there now and look at the sky and you let your eyes adjust, you'll notice there's all these little things flying around and, and it's these military drones. So I would photograph it just on large format film like this, and then when you get the negatives, you realize there are these little things that look almost like bugs, and you, you, if you look at the print, they're like reaper drones and predator drones and things like that. Mm. And, and, but again, you're looking at it in the relation to the history of the sublime, and, and always, the sublime was and is, I guess my favorite way of understanding the sublime is things that where you are confronted with your own, the limits of your own ability to perceive something, right? So the sublime is an encounter that you have with the limits of your own perception and with the limits of your own cognition. And I think that when we're, whether we're looking at, you know, assassination, warplane, drone robots in the sky, or satellites that don't exist, we're getting into this territory of, of where you're starting to see glimpses of a world that's immensely powerful, potentially immensely violent, and that is very, very difficult to understand, and, and, and it really stretches the limits of human perception. And this, is, this has a long tradition in art. I mean, this is Turner's, you know, you know apocalyptic, you know, reapers basically in the sky, and, you know, so again, looking at this historical axis, whereas Turner saw these monsters in the sky, well, now they actually exist. <laughs> you know, I mean, like this, you don't have to fantasize this stuff anymore. Like there actually is a reaper in the sky. Um, so in a lot of your work, you've shown how the digital is not immaterial. You've, yeah. you've shown the cables, fiber optics, the, uh, the data farms, whatever you call them, uh, server <laughs> yeah, farms, exactly, server farms. Yeah. Uh, and, and other kinds of infrastructure of the digital. Um, but it's also not as free as, as we all think, mm -hmm. and that's come up before. It's just not, a, it's not as free as we think. Um, and you've called the digital a surveillance platform of immense power. You've mm -hmm. already talked a little bit about yeah. your work there. But uh, as someone who's documented these mass surveillance sites, um, what, is, what does that look like? to you? I mean, I think that's the tricky thing, is that when we're talking about mass surveillance, um, one of the real questions that I have about this moment in history is that it feels immaterial, right? In the sense that, like, you, we, you have no bodily experience of the NSA surveilling you or Google surveilling you or what, what have you. And if you translated the, the the intrusive tactics that they use against you, if you translated that into a form that you could understand, it would literally be somebody standing behind you all of the time, taking, recording every keystroke that you made on your computer, logging everything that you looked at, looking over your shoulder at everything that you read, and you know, trying to, and, and collecting records of your most like, intimate secrets that you might tell to your shrink or your lover or something like that. And if, if that was our everyday experience of surveillance, I think a lot of us would be horrified and strongly object to that. But because the technology is so disembodied in a way, we don't have that experience of it. So let's look at the, um, at the autonomy cube yeah, uh -huh. as, as a kind of response to that. Here it is. Yeah. Uh, and this is a project that you uh, did with Jacob Applebaum, yeah. who was um, part of WikiLeaks and uh, also featured in Citizen Four, and who you uh -huh. knew previously and uh -huh. had worked with. So, yeah. So yeah. this is a um, a sculpture that is, um, you know, it's sort of a minimalist sculpture. It would you get stalled <laughs> typically in in museums or galleries. And what it does, it's, it's just this kind of bulletproof plexiglass thing with a couple of open source um, hardware boards in it. 
And what it does is it literally connects into the museum's internet connection. So you basically plug the museum's fiber optic cable into this sculpture, and then it does a couple of things. The first thing that it does is it creates an open Wi-Fi network throughout the museum that anybody can connect to for free. Um, but it takes all of that traffic and routes it over something called Tor. So it routes it over a series of volunteer-run servers across the world that, that are designed to anonymize people's traffic. So when you connect to this thing, the, um, the, the infrastructure that you connect to actually masks who you are and where you are. And when, you, when you're using the Tor network, you just appear like a random anonymous person anywhere in the world. So it's a way of kind of creating a kind of digital privacy. And by the way, it was a network that was created for um, people in repressive regimes like Iran or China to be able to circumvent state, servant, uh, state censorship of I the internet. I didn't know anything about it until I went to China recently with yeah. Laura Poitras right. to film Jacob Applebaum. Yeah. Um, collaborating with Ai Weiwei, and they were all on tour. Everybody yeah. was, was on tour. I said, yeah. what's that? I, I did, yeah, it's, a, it's, it, it's, just, it's, a, it's a series of tools that allow you to use the internet anonymously, um, which is the exact opposite of how the internet normally works. And what I like about it is that you basically install this thing in a museum. You have to collaborate with you know, the IT department. So this is us. We installed it at the Reina Sofia for a while in Madrid. Um, you, have to, you have to really work with the institution. And the, the sculpture actually becomes a part of the institution's infrastructure, right? So it becomes a part of, you know, if you were to install it, for example, at the new museum, it would become part of the new museum's infrastructure. And it also <laughs> makes your institution a tour relay. Mm -hmm. So not only does it anonymize all the traffic of the visitors at the new museum, for example, using it, it allows people from all over the world to use the new museum's internet connection as a way to anonymize themselves as well. So you actually become a part of this Tor network when you install this thing. Um, and so in a, in a way, it's trying to, I think of it as a, as a piece in the tradition of somebody like you know, Hans Hacke's kind of institutional critique, this, gener this, this history of artists who have looked at institutions and tried to critique them. But it's actually not a critique so much as a kind of enhancement. And I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, I firmly believe that civic institutions like libraries and like museums should be places where we can explore ideas and, and, and explore ideas without fear of surveillance and without fear of having our explorations come back to haunt us in some way. And um, I, I really do feel like these, these, these are, should be kind of sacred places in the society. And so in a way, this, um, this piece is, it is sort of trying to underline, underline that, kind of help institutions with that mission if they want to do that. In a way, it's a little bit also a, a, suggesting a, a, a different kind of future, a different kind of way in which technologies could be used, whereas now typically they're, they're used for more surveillance, more data collection, more, um, more, you know, uh, more refined uh, visitor statistics or what have you. I'm trying to imagine like what would a world be in which we use technology to enhance privacy, to enhance mm -hmm. freedom of uh, curiosity, or to ha to enhance um, our ability to explore ourselves. Do you have some images from Citizen Four too? I yeah, think I, I do. do. I think so. Yeah. So these yeah, are so these are images from the the film Citizen Four. And um, again, some of these images are very abstract. You know, so this is a, a seascape in, in Cornwall, which is probably one of the most important surveillance sites in the world because this sea is just filled with fiber optic cables and there's a massive NSA base um, overlooking the coastline where all these cables come on shore. This is giant NSA base at this place called Butte. So this is an example. Is there of that. anything in the title or the or the labeling that indicates that, or is that in in the film? Oh, if you're showing these well, so photographs. The, the, it, so these are actually not photographs. These are stills from stills. Uh, from the from the film. So in the film, I believe there's titles where it says where these places right. are. But if now, you were showing them as photographs or something like. So it. now this is also going to be a two channel video installation that will also debut at Metro in September, which is all stuff that I shot for the film that they didn't use. So I shot like 90 hours worth of material and they used like three minutes, which was what we were expecting. But I thought, well, I've just been like running around the world for the last eight months shooting this stuff. I should do something with it. Um, so uh, 
So no, I think actually not. It'll be, it's very kind of structuralist, kind of landscape, almost like a James Benning kind of, kind of film. And I, I, I like that ambiguity, I think. I mean, I really do a lot of research to identify specifically this place, this is what's going on. And then I let the image kind of speak itself and kind of let it be more abstract in a way, you know? Well, great. Maybe now we'll, Brian, you'll come back up and we'll talk together as a group. We, I think we great. have an extra chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think there's another slide. No? Oh, those are the other, that's the other. Oh. oh, these are, that's, that's like. Fun. So I wanted to just ask you both um, about um, how, you, how you think about platforms for experiencing your work, because you've worked across so many different platforms. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Do you have any ideal platforms or? Yeah, I don't, not. I mean, I guess for me, I, there's almost, there's all the different media that I use, whether that's a video or a photograph or even like a lecture or a talk like this or writing that I do. And I, and I feel like it's all different aspects of a kind of meta project, which is trying to see the world and trying to understand it, you know, with these, actually these very kind of simple goals. But I guess the way that I approach it is I try to create different kinds of media that allow different avenues into the kind of underlying work that I'm doing. So if you come hear me give a lecture, you'll get kind of one avenue into it. Whereas if you go see an exhibition, you might mm -hmm. get a different avenue into it. But I, I, I don't think about like any one media as being able to con contain, you know, a, uh, a, kind, a kind of complete story in a way. Oh, <laughs> okay. I thought it would be cool if an image was up instead of a okay. white screen. <laughs> I'll be, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Do you want to say something oh, about that? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I kind of I like to think of platforms as puzzles, and because I feel like an idea. I'm really interested in how ideas can version themselves through their experiences being altered or landscaped or managed in different platforms. And so, you know, when, I mean, the, I've, it's easy to talk about it with the movies, but when I was talking about like a context being like a, a sort of like sometimes being like the protagonist of the work itself, um, I, um, something that maybe is already made, if a new platform shows up, I, I would see that as like an opportunity to generate a different version and alter the meaning of that piece and reflect on the different ways it has resonated, you know, in culture and different people's experience with it and the feedback that we've gotten. But one of the things Lizzie and I have been focusing on a lot now is other kinds of platforms that, you know, aren't in the institutional setting or easy to access online. So we've been starting to look at like ga making games mm. and how that sort of just the ideas around this, this, the way games are structured, how, how they relate to a lot of the conceptual content that we're dealing with in the movies. And, you know, like something like the Oculus Rift doesn't totally work in an institutional setting the way it's designed at the moment. And, uh, but there's starting to be VR platforms and more people own them. And like, how do we create versions of, of like a body of work that transform and, and like, and, and accumulate different types of meaning there. So I, I just, I think the platforms are like generative and are generative. <laughs> <laughs> and both of you are so um, involved with collaboration, uh, deeply involved, it's kind of a yeah. core principle. Um, um, so, uh, where does collaboration end and authorship begin? We talked a little bit about that at lunch, but I'd love to hear a little more hmm. about your thinking. Do you want to go first? That. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can go first if you want. <laughs> oh, I don't mind. Okay, I, just, <laughs> I mean, I think, 
I'm sure Lizzie and I will talk about it a lot when, when we have our talk, but collaboration for, for me, it, you know, it's different for, with every person I collaborate with, sure. but in general, I don't know, I was thinking about the conversation we had at lunch today about like authorship, and I think that like because we have more of an ability to, to record all the different things that we're doing and uh, all of the contributions to a particular work are networked and people are working in these more networked ways, I think people are a little bit less afraid of their ideas disappearing and they're more excited about those uh, exchanges and they're less territorial because the technology is there to be less ter territorial and it's harder to be territorial and it doesn't feel good. So I just think people are very pro-authorship but have a different sense of it where there could be different versions of, of an authorship and you know it can mean different things in different contexts and for us, you know, what, what we see as like the signing author or whatever that means is just a person who like initiates a project, manages the arc of it, and is responsible for it being out in the world. But then there's a credit system for all of our pieces that have all the different other kinds of authorships that exist inside of the work itself. Um, so that's how we've sort of like come to terms with crediting. And mm -hmm. how did you experience collaboration? on the recent curatorial project. Oh, it was amazing. I, I loved it, it, that experience so much. For the much. new museum triennial. <laughs> I mean, I, I, was, yeah. I was really that surprised was... by how many artists didn't talk in this way that I'm used to hearing artists talk, where it's all, they're like always saying I, and, and they're like really inside their own heads, and it's like their practice, and it's like they're alone in a room, and so many people just were talking about their ideas in very unterritorial ways, and it was very exciting. And you know, when we were installing the work, I was taking photos of it, and people were, a lot of the artists, not all of them, you know, we talked to each one, and everyone has different relationships to the stuff, but it was exciting to see people in, encouraging, like showing process. Like a lot of people like, and often are nervous about their process being shown because it's exposing something that they're not ready to talk about yet. And I felt like, and oh, yeah, that's, I put these three slides together to kind of show an example of that. I mean, this sculpture by Frank Benson of Juliana got a lot of, you know, posts on the internet because it was so visually striking to people. But, and so I think it's the easiest one to like talk about like in a slide of this happening. But, you know, there's this post of it being installed, being, you know, uncrated. And then there's a post <laughs> of Juliana, she's standing next to it. And then there's this post someone else made with that, with the K-hole campaign, ad campaign stickers, where you know she's doing the pose underneath it, and all these different like versions of relating to this sculpture are aren't specific to its final state, and and it kind of creates a situation where there isn't a final state or like a final presentation of it, and you know these images are sort of more alive um, in the world than the sculpture itself because, you know, once the sculpture is not in the show anymore, like, where do you see it? You see it through this translation. And, and, I, and that, like, creates other forms of authorship. And so anything you make, like, it sprawls into, like, other authorships. And I just don't even think of that word, but I'm not anti it. Like, mm -hmm. I think authorship exists, but <laughs> I don't, so yeah. <laughs> Trevor, you're working on, um, you know, launching, you launched a satellite, you're launching another one, yeah. and um, obviously you're working with a lot of people yeah. to get those off the ground. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, Literally. <laughs> right, exactly. so, <laughs> no, absolutely. I, so, I mean, I, I, you know, even when I give talks, I'm con constantly using the word we, and people are saying, well, who do you mean we? I'm like, of <laughs> all the people that work on all this stuff. Um, so yeah, so with these, these are for example, these are some models for a, a project that we're working on right now to launch uh, a, a small satellite that looks like this. That then, um, once it goes into space, it becomes something like this and reflects sunlight down to Earth to create kind of an artificial star that will last a few weeks and then burn up. Um, yeah, and when you're doing a project like this, you know, I'm working with 
engineering companies and fundraising people and programming people and you know there's at the end of the day there'll probably be about a hundred people that will have worked on this project in a in a pretty substantive way um, and in that sense it it does so this is not authorship in the way that like a Rothko painting is authorship or something like that. I'm not going to the studio and coming out the end of, at the end of the day with something the exact opposite. I have an idea and then spend five years trying to fundraise and engineer and figure out how to do logistics. You know, I, there's that, that phrase like 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. I'm like, that's <laughs> an incredibly generous ratio. This is like 0.00001% <laughs> inspiration, you know. And this is going to function like a temporary star? Yeah, so the idea is that if you, if you put this in orbit around the Earth, what it would do is reflect sunlight down to Earth and create a kind of temporary star that would last about three weeks and then would burn up in the atmosphere. And the kind of goal of this project is actually similar to the autonomy cube in the sense it's just trying to make these impossible objects. It's trying to make an object that has no commercial value, has no um, scientific value, and has no military value whatsoever. So in that sense, it's like trying to build a satellite that is the exact opposite of every other satellite that's ever been made, and trying to imagine a world where we just made things because we wanted them to exist and because we thought that they were beautiful. And this was the you one that launched. Yeah, so that's and the Creative Time project that we did with the Creative Time, so it was to build. So this is a very different kind of satellite. This is a satellite. That looks like that one of your sets. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So this is a satellite that is actually really, it's in orbit now, and it's really, really far away from Earth. It's about 36,000 kilometers away. And, it's so, and this one is designed so that it is, so, it is close enough to Earth that it stays in orbit, but it's far enough away that that orbit never decays. So it literally just goes around the Earth forever, like forever meaning like billions of years, like further into the future than the entire history of life up to this point on That's on what it, it launched on? Yeah, so it launched on that. That's a proton rocket. It's basically an ICBM that's been modified to put a satellite on it. And oh, I, was an I was an artist in residence at MIT, and what I, what I went to MIT with, the question was, can we make images that, are, that can, one, live in space, and two, that are as archival as the sun? And so they were like, okay, sure, let's figure this out. And so we made this collection of images, then, then was put onto this satellite, and then put into this orbit very, very far away from Earth. So the idea is you're making almost like this ghost spaceship for the distant future. And um, yeah, so it's a, an incredibly complicated Did you conceptual think it might project be, that you can't actually see in real life. It might be found by someone someday? <laughs> I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I actually think that it won't ever be found by somebody or something ever, but I felt like Could despite be. the fact that I thought it was a kind of conceptual gesture, I felt responsible for engineering it in such a way that if somebody did find it two billion years from now or whatever, that it would that it would be relatively intact and kind of that that somebody could look at it, and so it, that was like this weird balancing act where you're making this highly conceptual project but also really trying to do the engineering right and like do everything, you know, wow. correctly in a in a in a way. So and and that's it blasting off. That's there. it blasting off from <laughs> Kazakhstan. They had to go to Kazakhstan because it was. Um, much more affordable. It was much more affordable to launch a rocket from <laughs> Kazakhstan than from, <laughs> than from Cape Canaveral. Um, there any well, NSA we didn't documents? have to pay for it. Somebody else paid for it. Were there any NSA documents on that? No, there weren't. This is pre-Snowden. This launched okay. in 2012. <laughs> and that, that little dot in the middle of that, pic of that image is, is our satellite you know, wow. in, in orbit. Those are some drawings. Uh, this is a, I like, there's dinosaurs are kind of a big part of this because I'm imagining that the humans are gone someday and then the dinosaurs come back. And then if the dinosaurs look up in the sky, then maybe they would see the dead satellites that the humans made like a billion years ago or whatever. Because so, <laughs> it's play, playing with time a lot. And, <laughs> so this, maybe this is where uh, the two of your work sort of comes together. I really have such different <laughs> approaches <laughs> and aesthetics. <laughs> uh, can anyone guess what that is? <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> it's a screenshot from the editing view of, so the, in this shoot, there was nine cameras. So each one of those is, is it's, and it's synced. So 
All right, when, when I was talking about Junior Ward, a high school movie earlier on, I was talking about the relationship to the camera and how it was different than I remembered it. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to create a situation where there was a, a new way of capturing where people didn't have a language for it yet and they haven't developed a way to express themselves as comfortably as they have now with a handheld camera. And so when, with these recent shoots we did, we had so many GoPros and cameras that everything was being captured in the surround and there wasn't like a main, ca uh, main camera. So people, when they were being directed, there was this interesting thing that happened where you know, someone might look at the camera that's closest to the person that fed them the line or they might look at the camera that's next to the person they feel the most comfortable with or they would find a camera or they just would just act in the middle of the room and nobody had like a sense of like what the rules were and so it's really interesting things were emerging but this is actually a shot of a bunch of different drones filming the same space and these are like you know consumer friendly um, you know personal drones <laughs> or quad, Lizzie calls them quadcopters because she doesn't want them associated with like the military drones. But um, she, she uh, is the one that like got us into this and then taught everyone how to fly them. Uh, but I, and I feel like the reason why I wanted to show this movie, yeah, was just to talk about the way things are being, or not this movie, this, this image, was imagining how new forms of capturing content are creating a, a, like a, a situation with data where it can be like mined in all these different ways and how, what does that mean for making movies and like sort of like the continuum where movies and games are sort of like meeting and you know, what's the director and the editor role and is that gonna become like more the role of the viewer and then is like the sort of the creativity that was once put into like directing and editing and scripting might just be in like setting up the parameters and the limitations of the, the, the thing that's being navigated by someone. So, um, you know, imagine if these things were not only co collecting like 360 views of everything, but they're also collecting, you know, smell and like depth and air temperature. At, at a certain point, it's almost like you can, it's like time travel. And, and that being like an inventive act where like the past and the future are both malleable, creative places that exist in the same realm. And sort of this like lack of like a mass narrative encouraging people to participate in multiple linearities in like a way that's like meshed and, and networked and where like contrasting and conflicting ideas can co-inhabit you know, somebody's state of being without it being a situation where you have to pick one or the other. You're just existing with, and there's like a diversification of the self and what that is in like more of a plural sense. Yeah. I think that's a great place to end. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an incredibly exciting time to be alive and an amazing time to be an artist. Thank you both. I think we'll take a few questions from the audience, but thank, thank you. you. Oh, thanks, Lisa. If we have time. We have time for a few questions. Over there. Yes. Uh, the technology today that allows you to do these things, I'm going to use it in a question about uh, self-defense and the vulnerabilities. And maybe Ryan, on a personal note, with alternative lifestyles, maybe 10 years ago, you couldn't capture people's uh, expressions because they were sort of defensive and weren't free to be vulnerable of what their alternative lifestyles were. And now with the technology, you can break it down and give a freedom that maybe 10 years ago you couldn't talk about. And maybe as far as Trevor goes, uh, more literally, maybe 10 years ago you didn't have the internet accessibility to find out all these government self-defense mechanisms. Uh, so I, I guess the question becomes, uh, what are the pluses and the minuses of going into these areas where maybe you're intruding from personal uh, preferences that maybe people don't want to know, or the government doesn't want you to know this, although it's out there for anyone to get once they try? Mm -hmm. You want to go first? Yeah, I mean, I think there... 
Yeah, so I, it's absolutely true that like, well, the way that I work would not be possible without the internet because I'm talking to an astronomer in Belgium over here and you know a magician in Colombia over there or what have you. Like it's just an enormous range of people. And I also do use the internet a lot for different kinds of research. So I can like get a, a nautical chart here and correlate that with something from Google Earth there and correlate that with you know some other piece of data that I have here and it can do this all really within minutes, and this would take months of you know, library research, you know, for example, before the internet. Um, and that does, there is a kind of irony there in the sense that I'm looking, I'm, at the same time I'm very critical of the internet in the sense that I really do think that it was developed with, by a lot of bright-eyed people who thought that this would be a, a, a technology to kind of create a global village, I mean, the, that would allow a kind of new kind of humanism through interconnections. And that is true to a certain extent, but it also has also had the effect of creating the, the greatest system of mass surveillance that the humans have ever built. And with that has a kind of enormous, uh, there is a kind of enormous totalitarian uh, possibility like with, mm. within that as well. So I, I guess, I don't have a position like here or there, like whether I'm pro-technology or anti-technology. It really is just working with the tools that you have available to you at that moment in history and, and, and trying to be critical of, of them while at the same time employing them. I mean, even the space stuff, you couldn't have done that 20 years ago because at that time really only NASA was the only game in town. I collaborate a lot with private space companies now, for example. Yeah. Bob? Sorry. 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 Yep. Um, I, I I, well, I think that we're not the same species. We're not the same species. <laughs> so I don't even think that the things we're making now are going to live in the same type of history that we're familiar with at the moment. So I, I don't think, I'm not trying to make things that are understood by a future that I can predict because I don't think history and the future are moving in a way that follows time in a way that we understand it right now. Because I, I mean, we're, you know, we're still, one of, the, one of the things with the triennial that Lauren Cornell and I were, were sort of trying to wrap our heads around is that a lot of the artists that people are labeling as like post-internet artists and stuff, when you really look at what they're making, their audience is like the last century. Because, and they're and they're like trying to it seems like they're trying to convince people of like this like sort of these different ideas. But then there's some artists that seem to be straddling that, which were the artists we were trying to focus on, that are assuming audiences in both places. There's like this, you know, the uh, and potential audiences, the 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 current place we're at, and then also you know the closest thing we are that we're to is this idea of history that you're describing, but. I think that trying to make things that are going to translate 
it's just the mediums and the tools that are available to us now are going to disappear, but it's important for us to be dealing with them. So it's just not, I just don't think it's going to exist and, and resonate. I don't think that's a goal for many people, and it's not a goal for me. I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in making things that people will definitely mine in the future, but they're going to gonna, they're gonna mine it for different reasons that I have no understanding of how, how that's going to work, and it's going to mean something totally different to them than it does to me, and I don't, need it. I don't need them to understand why I'm making it necessarily, but I do think that there will be tools in the future for them to understand it, so I'm not totally worried. Yeah. John. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think I just have a very similar attitude towards Ryan, where I feel like my job as an artist is to try to see the moment that we live in now. And yeah, when you we, you can look at like ancient Christian iconography or something like that, and there are parallels between that kind of image making and contemporary image makers, but I guess it's kind of less interesting to me in a way. Like, I'm actually not interested in images that explain themselves. I'm interested in images that don't explain themselves. And I guess, for me, the most, like, along that historical trajectory or that set of questions, I mean, it really is much more of a mo modern set of questions than a, than a, than a kind of a pre-modern set of questions. Um, I'm much more interested in an Agnes Martin, for example, than, you know, a, uh, you know, Russian iconographic, you know, Christian painting, for example. Yeah, but you're not getting my question. And the reason okay, I yeah. Apologize uh, for not watching. I lived on Agnes Martin, so I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Uh huh. I don't understand how your chart. Yeah. Which you know is fascinating visually of where the points of entry and whatever. Uh huh. Yeah. Why is that different than something in a scientific book that we just keep closed forever? Yeah. No. Absolutely. Well, I think in the in the images that I showed you today, like I didn't differentiate between things that are like artworks and things that are like fragments from my processes. So I think it probably, the, the, the things you're probably looking at is like, oh, there's, a, there's an email, is that art world? No, it's not, I'm just showing you an email to reveal a little bit of that process to you. I mean, the, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is the thing that we talked about initially, is like I do a huge amount of empirical work to make images that are basically opaque, you know, that basically are abstract, and basically if you looked at them, you know, in a museum or something like that, you'd be like, well, this could be anything, anywhere, or whatever, you know, and that, that's kind of the point, actually. Okay, Don. <clears throat> I'm a little bit troubled and confused. I think, from my own point of view, I don't believe in censorship on the internet and through Tor, there are other services like Anchor Free, which has 500 million users that are able to evade most government censorship, but your art is, by definition, political. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many satellites you found that are <laughs> hidden that don't belong to NSA, but belong to other other governments that might not be, I wouldn't call ours benign, but might be much less benign sure, than sure. ours. So how do you rationalize the, the use of that kind of data by you know, the, the often cited criticism is drug dealers and, and ISIS and yeah. all kinds of people that are trying to, to money transfer or do uh, all kinds of terrorist acts behind the scenes in an opaque internet with no censorship and nobody watching. In your art, how do you balance that part of what is obviously something very troublesome to all of us because you don't go to sleep at night feeling safe if there isn't somebody watching something. Mm -hmm. Now, what the right way to do that is, I don't pretend to know. Yeah. yeah. But so it is I, political I, I think by it's, nature. it's, yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it is political, but I also think that there's, that when you look at the world, the world is political. That's, you know, there's politics and everything that you, that you look at. Um, so I think to answer your question, it's really a case by case kind of project, you know, case by case kind of situation. So you got to keep in mind, yeah, I do kind of figure out where these secret satellites are, but also they're in the sky. Anybody with a pair of binoculars and enough time could do the same exact thing. It's not, it's not magic, <laughs> you know. I mean, it literally is in the sky. Um, with the thing with Tor, 
yeah, we are creating a system that allows people to use the internet anonymously, and people do do bad stuff on the internet. You don't need Tor to launder money. You don't need Tor to buy drugs or download child porn or whatever, what have you. The point is that you're never going to live in an entirely secure or safe world, but at the same time, us humans living here in 2015, we are the safest human beings that have ever existed on the planet by far, right? We are absolutely like leaps and bounds safer than anybody who's ever existed on planet Earth. Um, so I think that, that we should keep that in mind when we allow ourselves to be motivated by fear and worry about, um, because I think that fear motivates us to do uh, things that are maybe not in the best long-term interest of a democratic country. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> so, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Trevor, and thank you, Ryan. I think we've seen hyper people in some of Ryan's works, and we've seen emissions and transmissions in, in Trevor's works, and, and now I think we should all go forward with no fear. Everything <laughs> out there is, is waiting for us, and I look forward to seeing you at Casa Tua. Thank you so much. Thank you.